thank you very much. Uh, I hope my uh, I'm sharing screen. Uh, can see, we can see. All right, thank you very much. Um, John Yonidis, uh, Stanford academic, has this to say about uh, common um, current medical research. He said that the contemporary research in the field of medicine mostly comes into wrong conclusions. Now, this is from a man who has the most cited, most downloaded publication of all time. This particular publication from Plus Medicine has been downloaded more than a million times. And this is a pretty damning statement for all of us who do research. Now, with this uh, pretty disheartening statement, let's move on with this talk. Now, objective of a researcher is to have a successful outcome for his concept or project, and we would like to secure a grant and be recognized by our peers. We would like to present our data in a symposium and get publication in a high impact factor journal. However, as uh, Ioannidis has cited, many research studies, including clinical studies, can be flawed. And many studies are revised and rejected at the level of the ERC and will find it difficult to get published, even if it is successful at the ERC. Though we want to get our research published at a high impact journal, very often we end up getting published at a low impact journal. Or unfortunately, some of us, unfortunately, seek the help of predatory journals. Now, some publication flaws are discovered after publication and need retraction. Now, out of 2047 retractions, which had happened over the last four decades, only a fifth were due to genuine errors. Shockingly, four fifths were due to fraud. Now, that's a completely different topic, which needs a, another forum to address. Now, for the genuine researchers, the first stumbling block or the safety net, whichever way you, like, you would like to put it, if the ethics and review committee, as Chandani very clearly put it, the role of the ERC, again, is not just to look at ethics, is to make sure that the scientific study is truly scientific and it has validity. And in addition to that, of course, is to protect the subjects, be it human or animals, from the treatment or the whatever measure that you are going to make and the benefits outweigh the risks. And then for the researcher, we have to find the money to do the research, which of course is difficult. It's very far and few between. But of course, good research can be done with minimal funding, just like low budget movies. Like, for example, some of you might know that Rocky, a super hit, was done with minimal funding. Then finally, it comes the publication barrier. Where again, we need, we are aiming for the sky. We might end up pretty low down. We should never, of course, fall prey to predatory journals. Now, it's shocking that we might never get ourselves published because there are 6,500 peer-reviewed scientific journals publishing 2 million papers every year. So if you really try, we can get our research published somewhere. But we continually do errors. And most of these errors are methodological errors. But then, of course, there are a few of us who intentionally do malpractices. Now, how do you overcome errors? There are three things that we have to pay attention to. First, of course, is to plan out your research project very well 
and not to do what is called shotgun research. Second, is to be part of a research team. And thirdly, of course, the most important is to understand the key elements of research design. Now, what is meant by a shotgun research is doing or uh, having a blind hit, having absolutely no idea what you want to do, is just doing something, doing some research without having a hypothesis. For example, having, you know you have a lot of COVID patients these days in the wards, say, let's look at the COVID patients and see what we can find. A cardiologist might say, I have done 500 angioplasties over the last five years. I would like to analyze the data and see what I can find. No hypothesis there, just the numbers. For 1,200 diabetic patients in my clinic, let's look at them and see what we can uncover. No hypothesis of what you want to look at. That's certainly not a way, good, very good way of doing research or starting research. Be part of a research team. Run your ideas with your team members. Teaming up with helpful, experienced researchers is important. But very important here, before you team up, before you start the research, design and decide the, the role of each member. There should be no passengers. In a team, there should be a principal investigator, a co-investigator, sub-investigator, or multiple of them, if you have the luxury of that, a regulator for in coordinator, they are who does the dirty work for you, like, you know, writing the documents, submitting the stuff for the IR ethics review committee, data coordinators who are involved in collecting data, managing the data, research coordinator, who does the nitty gritty. Now, you might think this is only for sophisticated research or large studies. This applies even if you are a senior registrar who's starting off with the research project and there are only another registrar and an SHO to help you. You don't need five, all five people in your team. Just decide who's going to do what and design and decide on the work beforehand. So who's going to be the coordinator for research, the data coordinator, and who's going to do what? It's very important to decide on this. And then understand the key components of study design. Tick off them. So a good study obviously have to have objectives, the variables. Some studies need a control group. And if you are going to do randomization, a blinding would be necessary. Stratification, you have to decide how we are going to do that. Is it a randomization or a stratification which is necessary? Define the study population. Consider inclusion, exclusion criteria. What exactly are you going to analyze? The primary analysis or secondary analysis if you have something like that. The data collection points, the ethical issues, the risk benefit ratios time frame of the study and the real feasibility of the study. All of these have to be designed well before you embark on the study. Now, despite all this, we all do errors. Now, in the next few minutes, I'll illustrate some examples that we can make. Now, these are, most of this is fiction, some of this fact. So don't take any of these things personally if they do resemble some of the studies which you may have participated in. Now, you need a good research question. So originality of the research question is key. You have to be creative in designing a research question. You can't copy somebody else's idea and do research. So to get a research idea, I'm sure Professor Janaka may have spoken about this in the morning, you need a very good idea about the subject that you want to research on. So you need a hypothesis. To do and develop a very good idea, you should be able to think out of the box. To be able to think out of the box, 
you should not be a guideline follower. If you are just a guideline follower, a trial follower, and just follow A to Z like everybody else, you'll never come across a research idea of your own. Now, for instance, there was this study proposed by someone we knew. A prevalence of hypoglycemia among patients attending a diabetic clinic in the Ragama Hospital. A good study. It was very useful. But strangely, a few months later, from the same unit, another study appeared, a proposal, prevalence of hypoglycemia among patients attending a diabetic clinic in the Kangana Hospital, which is very close by. So clearly a replication, a copycat study. This was obviously shot down by the ERC because it's the same ethics committee who was reviewing this. They found this rather uh, embarrassing actually to review this. And this second study was shot down. So this is clearly lack of imagination, being lazy to decide on your own projects. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Now, does having a stroke unit improve the outcome of patients with stroke? Now, you set up the stroke unit for the first time, trying to identify the improvement of the outcome of a stroke unit. Yes, of course, it's useful. But repeating the study over and over again, it's absolutely of very little value. Better control of diabetes is protective against development of retinopathy, something which we all know. Doing this study again, I don't, really don't know what the value of a study like that would be. These kind of studies are very commonly done. An audit of warfarin use in the warfarin clinic in Ragama. Now, it's better if a new intervention in this clinic, for example, if this is just hypothetical, a warfarin nurse has been introduced, and whether this warfarin nurse's introduction improved the care. You know, this new intervention, whether that improved the standard of care, that I think is a better study. You should know the subject which you propose to study. If you yourself, the researcher, is clueless, doesn't know the fundamentals, there's no way of progressing. A study which was proposed uh, was defined as a prevalence of CKD in the community in Ratnapura. The CKD was defined as an EGFR, estimated GFR, below 90. Fundamentally flawed, EGFR below 60 is the definition for CKD. So obviously this was shut down uh, because the experts this was referred to didn't want the people to progress because uh, they found that this, you know, the team obviously had no subject experts in the team. It's better to be doing studies in an area where you are actually comfortable in. For example, clinical studies led by geneticists or molecular biologists or medical people trying to do molecular biology studies, leading them when their training is not in that field. For, for example, Description of thalassemia intermedia in Sri Lanka, where thalassemia intermedia is a clinical disease. This, if you if you are purely a molecular biologist, and if you are the only one who's doing this study without backing up a clinical team, this doesn't sound logical. A project proposal which says analysis of the mutation pattern of COVID-19 genome and its relationship to severity. If you are a clinician with very little training in molecular biology, it doesn't again make sense that you should be uh, starting on a project like this, just because you have the funding. But methodological flaws are far more common than this. Now, methodology is the craft to harvest the results of new knowledge. It's the crux of the paper that you write. It defines the population, the size, time frame, techniques, interventions, inclusion and exclusion criteria, and the kind of analysis that you do. Now, unfortunately, some of us 
pretend to be or are jack of all trades and too proud to ask for help. Having a statistician, an epidemiologist in the research team improves the chances of publication. This has been proven time and time again. Don't try to do it all by yourself. If you are, unless you are really good at it. Things can go wrong at the time of design itself. And as mentioned before, population size is the key defect in most of the studies. If the population size is too small, the results will not be statistically significant. If it's too large, it could be too costly. A study which was recently proposed was a satisfaction, satisfaction survey for vaccine coverage of people in the Colombo district. The sample size was 150. The total at risk of population in Colombo was 2.3 million. They wanted to do a study out of just 150 people. This was obviously not, you know, a good study at all. The sampling technique, who are you going to sample? In the district of Colombo, vaccination coverage, are you going to take a random sample? Are you going to take a cluster sample? The population of Colombo has so many people of so many diverse ethnic groups, social groups. Are you going to take people from Colombo 7 or from the housing units? So the sampling technique again becomes crucial. There has to be a match of the objective and the design. An another study where objective was to study the prevalence of anemia in the elderly population in Sri Lanka, but the design was sample of 300 people, elderly people from Ragama. And to postulate the anemia in the Ragama population to the entire nation of Sri Lanka. So this was obviously not going to work. So this would have probably been a good study if the authors wanted to say prevalence of anemia in Gampaha rather than Sri Lanka, a tiny, uh, well, you could say just a single word, but suggested that the, the authors had not really thought through the project very well. Does your project need controls? Every project does not need controls. For example, a recently conducted study by us, where we studied the older thalassemia patients to see whether there was evidence of neurological effects, particularly in the brain to see evidence of cerebral vascular disease in thalassemia patients. The patient group was 20 to 40 years of age. Now, the, did that need controls? The answer was, of course, yes. We, we needed to control it with normal people. So we had to do MRIs of 100 patients and 100 controls. And that turned out to be a pretty expensive study, whereas we initially started thinking the budget was only for 100 MRIs of thalassemic patients, we ended up having to do 200 MRIs of 100 patients and 100 controls. So planning for this would be necessary. Questionnaire falls have to be, uh, is another area of thing. The questionnaires sometimes have to be self-administered or examine-administered. One such questionnaire on a nutrition survey where the patient or the uh, person was filling up the questionnaire asked, what, what was your father's BMI? Would any one of us know what the father's BMI is? Neither self-administered or the examiner would ever be able to answer this. So it's important to be practical, think it through before you decide on these uh, simple issues. Decide on what is meant and what should come as an inclusion criteria and an exclusion criteria. Now, inclusion criteria for a study is essentially the properties which are important in the target population. But more importantly, what is an exclusion criteria? Very often, researchers uh, suggest everything that is not an inclusion criteria is an exclusion criteria. 
and they of course get turned down. Now exclusion criteria are defined uh, either as based on ethical reasons, they are due to being children, pregnant women, being disabled, or being unable to give consent, or those who have, who, where the data is going to interpret the study due to comorbidities. So the reason why you put an inclusion and exclusion has to be clearly thought out when you're deciding the study. And then of course, finally, data errors, measurement errors. When you're doing the study, be very carefully collecting the data. Don't have missing data fields. If you have missing data fields, make sure that is included in the ultimate data analysis. And of course, data handling. Entry errors, unit incompatibilities, they have to be handled at the point of data entry. And make note of dropouts during the study period itself. And the statistician becomes key at the very end of the study, where data cleaning has to be done. Where there's multiple data fields and they have to be all sorted out before the analysis. And then the data analysis, you have to come out with the correct outputs. And the reporting has to be essentially where you translate the results into a coherent uh, analysis. At this point, it is the, the PI rather than the statistician who plays the role. Because sometimes the statistician might come up with a p-value of something which is completely irrelevant. Because the statistical analysis might come up with, one of, in one of the recent studies where we were involved in, in senior patients, the only, the major, the single most significant, uh, uh, statistically significant uh, point for survival in thalassemia patients was gallstones. But we all know, people who are involved in clinical medicine, that gallstones' role in survival in human beings is trivial when compared to anemia or iron overload. So though the p-value is very significant, the way you interpret that and the way you write up the data becomes important. So just because there's a very, very highly significant p-value, it does not necessarily mean that that is the most important thing in your paper. So be careful in using the data in the final uh, presentation. And finally, I'm sure Dr. Vijay Sitara is going to talk a lot about this, errors in writing. You might have done a brilliant project, but if you don't know how to market it, you get flawed. So the abstract uh, needs to be able to capture the story. The introduction should never become a history lesson. The results, uh, the researcher should be able to uh, be able to present the key findings without wasting too much words. The discussion should never repeat the results. It should interpret rather than repeat the results. And in the conclusion, you should not repeat the discussion. It should be a different thing. And the whole, the final paper should not be a boring old story. And that would basically lead to a rejection. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for that very important topic and ideas. There is a question for you. In multidisciplinary team where there are many members, how can we select authors for the paper? Uh, what is the rationale in terms of giving authorship? I think that's a, a very tricky uh, question. I think that deciding on authorship, there are very strict criteria. Um, and I, you should stick to the uh, criteria because if you, if you write the paper in uh, most uh, respected, reputed international journals, uh, selecting authorship is essentially based on the contribution to work, i.e. no gift authorships. 
no passengers and it is not based on seniority and it is not for your head of department not to your wife not to your girlfriend it is based on the work you do thank you so much anuja for that very informative presentation and it's a topic that is being neglected i think you have highlighted the most important pitfalls that has to be uh, you know known by all researchers thank you for joining us on behalf of the sl let me we appreciate your attempts thank you